cut into it already. Uh, can I say the next item of business is a debate on motion 10650 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne on early years in childcare. I can invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak in to the little to to press their request to speak buttons now. Uh, I call on Michelle Ballantyne to speak and move the motion. Ms Ballantyne, 13 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to bring this motion to the Chamber and I move it in my name. Early learning and childcare is one of the most important areas for any government. Not only does it shape the lives of whole generations, it creates the foundation for Scotland's future. High quality early learning can play a key role in reducing the attainment gap by giving all of Scotland's children a level playing field on which to build their learning. There is compelling evidence to show that early access to high quality early learning and childcare can significantly reduce the impact of socioeconomic disadvantage before starting school. And high quality early learning provides nurturing, stimulating experiences that help children grow and develop. And it can support parents, particularly mothers, to access education, to access, sorry, education, training and work, as well as providing support to vulnerable families. The provision of early learning and childcare is quite simply a policy that no one would want to oppose. It is an investment in the very fabric of our society, and it is for this reason that I am bringing this debate to the Chamber today. The Scottish Government have, in their words, set out the most ambitious expansion of funded early learning and childcare this country has ever seen. But I'm afraid I think they did so without undertaking the level of planning and consultation that might reasonably have been expected, and in doing so have created significant challenges to what I see as a flagship policy. Today is an opportunity to explore those challenges in what I hope will be a constructive and thoughtful manner. Today is about ensuring that the issues raised in the joint report issued by the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General are scrutinised, and that we in this chamber, and perhaps more importantly, the local authorities, nurseries, childminders and parents who are trying to navigate their way through what is being offered, ensure that the end result is something to be celebrated. In opening this debate, I want to cover just a number of the issues raised in both the report and from my visits and many conversations with early years practitioners and both local authority and private nurseries and childminders. Deputy Presiding Officer, on Thursday last week, the First Minister told the Parliament, and I quote, that we delivered the commitment on 600 hours when so many people across the chamber were sceptical that we would do so. We delivered it, we have shown a track record in delivering expanded childcare, and we are on track to deliver the next expansion. However, the Accounts Commission and Auditor General's report clearly states the Scottish Government failed to set out clearly the improved outcomes for children and parents that the expansion to 600 hours was designed to achieve. Furthermore, there is a lack of evidence that increasing funded hours in this way that the Scottish Government has done so far will, improve delivered, sorry, will deliver improved outcomes. I would therefore ask the Minister when she comes to speak, how are you measuring the success of the 600 hours rollout and how do we know that it has been delivered and has been a success? To me, it is clear that the Scottish Government did fail to set out cle clearly the improved outcomes for children and parents that the expansion was meant to achieve and equally how it would assess the impact of that additional investment. There were no measures to indicate success, nor was the baseline data available. And these basic steps should have been addressed in 2014, if not earlier. It would appear that these issues have also carried over to the 1140 hours expansion, with a recent Freedom of Information request from Reform Scotland revealing that the Scottish Government has confirmed that it does not know how many children are currently eligible and entitled to preschool provision, but are unable to access, sorry, dry mouth, access it or are on a waiting list. Additionally, research by the Scottish Government, the National Day Nursery Association and Fair Funding for Our Kids have found that one in five children are missing out on their current funded hours. And yet the Scottish Government claim there is a 97% registration for funded childcare. So are we talking about registration 
or are we talking about access and delivered? When it comes to planning an expansion on this scale, should the Scottish Government not start by getting these essential facts right? Not because we want to pull them up on it and not because we want to make an issue of it, but because if it's not right, then we are going to get it wrong for our children, a generation of children who will not get a second opportunity. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government do need to be clear about the priority of this policy. Is it for children? Is it for parents? Or is it for both? As in its current state, it largely fails to achieve the outcomes for both. Indeed, in January, the Scottish Government published an initial evaluation of the expansion of early learning, in which it states the expansion from 475 to 600 hours in 2014 is not expected to lead to measurable change in children's outcomes. We've also seen this reflected in parents' responses to the expansion, particularly around flexibility, accessibility and payment. Research by Fair Funding for Our Kids has found that after the implementation of the expansion to 600 hours, nine out of 10 parents who want to change their working situation say that their main barrier is lack of appropriate childcare. The Scottish Government then estimates that the cost of delivering the 1140 hours of early learning and childcare will be around 840 million pounds a year. Councils, on the other hand, have placed their initial estimate for the expansion at around a billion a year. This is far higher than the Scottish Government's estimate and does raise serious questions about the feasibility of the policy and risk councils being left to deal with a £160 million black hole. To further add to the confusion around funding, the Scottish Government are saying there is a big difference as well in the essential changes to childcare infrastructure with local authorities setting aside £600 million capital funding between 2019 and 20, and the Scottish Government have only allocated £400 million for this purpose. At a time when councils across the country are feeling pressure on their budgets, they will struggle to make up the shortfall. Yes, sir. Stuart McMillan. I thank Michelle Ballantyne for taking the intervention, but uh, on the issue of funding, uh, if Michelle Ballantyne is seriously concerned about the issue of funding, how then would her party actually have, have paid for and funded uh, this particular policy if there's going to be another £500 million reduced from the Scottish budget? Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I, I think uh, if Stuart had taken the time to read our manifesto and our approach to this, they would have found that we wouldn't have gone about it in the same way. We would have taken a staged approach to it, starting with the most vulnerable one- and two-year-olds and working forwards. And, and I think in many ways this is about how you plan it, not just a good intention. We don't disagree with the intention. It's about whether we can actually deliver it. And I say we, because in the end, this is about all of us. It's about all the local authorities and it's about all of our children. Areas of such as Midlothian, which is one of the ones that will struggle, it's the fastest growing local authority in Scotland and they will be particularly hard hit as they struggle to find both the revenue and the capital funding needed to implement this policy. And this will only be compounded by pressures on partner provider areas in the, area, in the area, such as after school clubs who are already struggling and they're seeing their rents raised as budget cuts are made. In addition to these financial pressures, the Scottish Government has estimated that an additional 8,000 whole-time equivalent staff will be required to implement the expansion. And yet the Council's estimations show that they need 12,000 more staff, including staff in training and central staff. Mm -hmm. Now, I am aware that the Scottish Government have launched a recruitment drive, but this is still a daunting figure and a significant difference in numbers. Mm -hmm. The First Minister told the Chamber on Thursday that the Scottish Further and Higher Education Funding Council is offering about 1,500 additional places, and there are 836 additional graduate level places. Now, I'm not deny, decrying the efforts being made, but is this really going to be enough staff to, to complete this ambitious expansion of childcare in Scotland? Mm. Research by Skills Development Scotland cast doubts on this, 
showing that although partner providers are optimistic about retaining existing staff, 63% are already reporting it, finding it difficult or fairly difficult to recruit suitable new employees. Indeed, partner providers may well struggle with the introduction of the 1140 hours because 41% are not confident about their ability to accommodate the expansion. This in part may be due for them to a loss of staff because they are finding a drain from the partner providers to council providers who can offer more generous pay and conditions. And I noted that recently on a visit to a nursery, which is an exemplar, and it was indeed an exemplar. It was an excellent um, example of how 1140 can be delivered. But the problem is they had a purpose-built building that was already there. They had all the staff they needed, and they were heavily oversubscribed. Um, so I think we have to give some real thought to how our partner providers are actually going to cope. I've visited several private nurseries across the country and spoken to many of the managers and owners who have confirmed that this is the case. If partner providers continue to lose their most qualified staff, this will impact on the future quality of childcare available to parents, as well as pushing up the fees in order to retain these staff. And this in turn, could limit parents' choice in finding a local high-quality nursery or lead to private nurseries closing down. And I would be very interested to hear today what the government's position is when it comes to the money, because the partner provider offer at the moment, which is sitting between usually 345 and 375, will not cover the costs that, that private nurseries need to deliver the offer that they are in, is intended. Mm -hmm. Minister. I can absolutely understand why the member is concerned because in England where the Tories are in charge, the NDNA has said about the expansion process there, the Chancellor has given a clear message that this government is not interested in properly investing in early years and just expects the sector to get on with it while faced with all of these increases. NDNA will continue to lobby the government to address this appalling situation until a fair hourly funding rate and business rates relief for nurseries are forthcoming. In contrast, do you agree? I, I, think, with I think that's a long Nima? intervention, Minister. I think, please, it's, please, that's a good point. It's a long intervention. I'll give you your time back. I think, I think two things from that, Minister. If you are reading all about that and you feel there are real issues south of the border, then this should be a learning curve for you in terms of what to do. And actually, it, it's, it's an interesting one because they are rolling out the 1140 hours. At the moment, parents in England are accessing the 1140 hours and the complaint is not around their ability to access it. Yep. So I think there is learning to be had both negative and positive, but it does not immediately address the issues I just raised, and the question was not one that was pertinent to what I just said. The Accounts Commission has added that many Council's expansion plans do not include detailed information on how they plan to recruit all these additional staff. It, and often the plans do not take account of the numbers of staff required by partner providers. And I wonder whether that may account for some of the differences that we're seeing between the government numbers and the, um, sorry, thank you, and the, um, and the numbers that are coming forward from local councils. There are many, many other issues that I'm sure will be raised today around this. But my key issue in all of this is that we have to do right by our children and by our parents. Mm -hmm. And for our children, we will only do right by them if we have high quality provision. We know and evidence shows us that poor quality provision will do more harm. Yep. It will actually lessen the chances, particularly of our more vulnerable children, mm -hmm. in their life chances going forward. We cannot have high quality provision unless we have good quality staff, which means, means we need to roll out provision that is staffed by people who have good quality learning themselves, good quality um, um, qualifications and experience. And I worry that, that in this rush, 
there is not going to be the time to develop these staff adequately. So many of our initial children will suffer from a poorer quality provision than we actually intend to give them. Thank you. Please conclude. Thank you. Um, I now call on Marie Todd to speak to move amendment 10650.3. Eight minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The expansion of funded early learning and childcare will transform our children's life chances. By 2020, we will provide all three and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds with 1140 hours of high quality nursery education and will ensure that all of our children get the best start in life. Such ambitious plans always come with challenges and I do not deny that they exist but we are absolutely committed to addressing them in partnership with local authorities and other delivery partners, and we are on track to deliver this expansion. Expanding funded... Yes? Michelle Ballantyne. Can the Minister tell me how um, and on the, what basis of evidence that you are on track to deliver? Minister. Audit Scotland have looked at this process at a point when there is still some distance between our figures and local authority figures. It is right and proper that both sides take the time to challenge and refine cost estimates. And that is exactly what is happening at the moment. The gap is currently closing. We have said that we will fully fund this. We are working in close partnership and we expect to reach agreement in the next few weeks. Expanding funded early learning and childcare is the right policy. The socio-economic gap in cognitive development starts before primary school and it's widely acknowledged, including by the OECD, that universally accessible and high quality early learning and childcare helps to provide children with skills and confidence to carry into school education. And that's a cornerstone for closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Parents recognise the benefits of high quality early learning and childcare for their children. And in fact, Audit Scotland's own research found that parents were overwhelmingly positive about the quality of early learning and childcare that we are providing. And quality will absolutely remain at the heart of our expansion plans. We are offering children new and richer experiences through this expansion. I too am visiting many nurseries. Last week, I visited the City of Edinburgh Council's Forest Kindergarten at Lauriston Castle, and I saw how outdoor learning affects children's confidence and well-being and can encourage a lifelong love of the outdoors. We're working with Inspiring Scotland and councils to encourage a much greater use of outdoor environments as part of this expansion. It's a real opportunity to change the offering that we provide. And we're investing over 800,000. Yes. Smith. Nobody is denying in this chamber that there are a lot of good things in the report too, particularly about the objectives, the strategic objectives that the Scottish Government has. The specific point though, however, is that up to the 600, power, uh, 600 hours policy, the Scottish Government does not appear to have any convincing analysis about the benefits and the delivery of that output. Could I ask the Minister why that analysis has not been done? Minister. So there's a huge body of evidence from around the world on delivering, on, on providing this to close the attainment gap. Are you suggesting that we wait longer before we do that? I know that your party does not support this expansion. We do, and we're going to do it. We must never forget that the fundamental purpose of this policy is to improve the early years experience of our children. However, we know that it will also support parents and help to lift families out of poverty. By increasing the funded hours of childcare, we'll support parents to work, train and study, unlike the offering down in England, where it's only for working parents, without the burden of massive childcare costs. The full entitlement to 1140 hours will save families over 4,500 per child per year. The near doubling of funded entitlement offers parents greater flexibility of provision. Flexibility should be determined by local authorities engaging with their communities to understand and respond to their needs. 
all within a framework of high quality provision. Yes, I'll give way. Rachel Hamilton. Intervention. The feedback that um, I've been getting from parents is that the actual childcare is inflexible. Uh, does the minister agree that this is preventing women getting back into the workplace because of that inflexibility? Minister. Yes, that is because the 600 hours is limited. That is precisely why we're expanding to 1140 hours. We committed to fully funding this expansion as we more than fully funded the expansion to 600 hours and the introduction of eligibility for two-year-olds. And we recognise that reaching timely agreement on a multi-year funding package for expansion is absolutely critical. That's why the programme for government commits to agreeing a funding package. And that's why we have been working so closely with local authorities uh, ever since to reach a shared understanding of the investment we need to make, I'm confident we will do that by the end of April. Yes, I'll give way. Daniel Johnson. The, the minister raised a point about uh, eligible two-year-olds. A quarter of two-year-olds are eligible for childcare, but only 10% seem to be taking up according to the Audit Scotland figures. Why does she think that's the case? Minister. There are definitely a number of um, challenges involved in identifying and targeting the offering to those two-year-olds and we are working on it with local authorities. We're also working with the DWP to perhaps identify and target and, and share data and identify and target them, but there is an issue there, I accept that. There's a huge body of work going on behind the scenes to deliver the expansion. And in the last year alone, we've produced an ELC quality action plan on which the NDNA, you'll be very interested to hear, said of the offering in Scotland, it really shows that the Scottish Government has listened to and worked with the sector, including NDNA Scotland, in its proposal to improve quality in early years. We've produced a skills investment plan, an online resource for childminders, plans for an additional graduate in nurseries in Scotland's most deprived communities from August this year, a multidisciplinary delivery support team to work with local authorities to provide innovation and redesign capacity, phase one of a national workforce recruitment marketing campaign to positively promote careers in ELC, and updated guidance for careers advice organisations. Many of these actions relate to the need to expand the workforce and in fact we estimate that up to 11,000 additional workers will be required by 2020, creating job opportunities across all of Scotland. The investment to do this is already well underway. To support the first phase of the workforce expansion in 2017, we provided local authorities with 21 million additional revenue funding boosted ELC capacity in colleges and universities and increased ELC modern apprenticeship starts by 10%. I'm afraid I'm in my last minute. We estimate that the combined effects of this investment will have supported over 2,000 additional practitioners to enter the ELC workforce in 2017-18. We'll build on that next year in 2018-19 with an additional 52 million for local authorities for workforce expansion providing 1700 additional hnc and over 400 additional graduate places and a further 10 percent increase in elc modern apprenticeship starts our approach to phasing in the expanded entitlement prioritizes those communities where the children need it most Families across Scotland are already benefiting from early rollout of the expansion, with over 3,000 children receiving the expanded entitlement. Yes, there are challenges, but we are on track and we are confident that we will meet them. I hope that all parties represented in this chamber can unite behind our ambitions for Scotland's children and support us in working in partnership with local authorities private and voluntary providers and parents to deliver the expansion and entitlement. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, I am currently giving uh, speakers uh, time back for interventions, but I warn you, only got a few minutes left to spare. I'm sorry I had to say that when you're about to rise, <laughs> Mr Gray. You're about to open for Labour. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer, and I do expect to get the time back for your own intervention there. <laughs> There is, oh, no, no. Never, there is a, never challenge and never go to the chair. <laughs> there is a certain irony, I think, in us having this debate on a day uh, when the childcare arrangements of families across most of Scotland have collapsed under the weight of the snowfall with nurseries and schools uh, closed. Now, I bow to no one uh, in the capacity to blame the government 
for almost anything. However, however, even I, I suppose, cannot expect them to be able to stop the snow falling. But we should, we should also acknowledge that parents face the collapse of childcare arrangements on a regular and entirely predictable basis. Every time schools and nurseries go on holiday or when their children reach the age of five and suddenly have to be at school later or finish school earlier than their previous arrangements allowed. Parents really need childcare to be full-time, flexible, all age, year round and affordable beyond what free hours uh, might be on offer at nursery. That was the message that the Independent Commission on Childcare gave so strongly to us uh, only a few years ago. Breakfast clubs, after school clubs, early morning and twilight wraparound care all can make or break uh, childcare, especially in as much as it allows parents and especially women to work. To be clear, the Commission supported the expansion of free nursery hours and so do we. But they were critical of a government focused exclusively on those free hours for three and four year olds to the detriment of other elements of childcare. Nonetheless, that has been the approach uh, of this government, the increase to 600 uh, hours per year and the promise uh, of 1,140 hours by 2020. And so it is that which has been considered by Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission. And that report it is not positive, uh, although it does have a few positive comments, pretty well, uh, all of which indeed the Minister has harvested uh, into her amendment. But in fact, with regard to the current provision of 600 hours, the report is clear that the expansion was not properly planned, that no economic modelling was carried out, no appraisal was made of options for delivery. And the, the government has never made clear whether this is a measure to allow parents to work or a measure to improve educational outcomes for children. It has talked always, I, I agree, about quality, but it has never defined, what it, Scotland tells us, what it means by high quality. Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm interested in what Mr Gray would suggest the government should have done in identifying either this to be a measure to improve outcomes for children or to enable parents to get back to work. What would his judgment have been in that respect? Ian Gray. Uh, my judgment is, as I think uh, Mr Swinney would agree, that both are important, but primarily this is about improved educational outcomes for children and addressing inequality. But Audit Scotland is clear that some decisions about how the policy has been delivered have not taken that view, but have rather uh, taken the view that it is in fact about uh, making it possible for, for parents uh, to work. So the figures uh, appear to suggest that most three and four year olds uh, do access funded hours. But again, Audit Scotland is clear that the effect of multiple registration makes these figures highly unreliable. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Johnson indicated a moment ago, uh, only half of eligible two year olds uh, are registered. So if the purpose of the policy is about allowing parents to work, then most parents tell Audit Scotland that the 600 hours has had a limited impact on their ability to work. And the Minister, I think, acknowledged that in responding uh, a moment ago to an intervention. That certainly reflects the research Fair Funding for Kids uh, has done with parents repeatedly raising the issue of families unable to access their entitlement because of inflexibility. Uh, but, presiding officer, the Audit Scotland report saves its greatest concerns for the implementation of the new promise uh, of 1,140 hours. It identifies significant challenges and major risks, points out that detailed planning should have started earlier than it did, and that even when it did, councils were asked to plan in the absence of clear information they needed from the Scottish Government. The report provides chapter and verse on risks around finance, infrastructure and workforce. On finance, as we've already heard, by 2021, a £160 million black hole between the annual running costs estimated by councils and the finances promised so far by government. With regard to infrastructure, the story is, is the same, though largely worse, with councils planning to spend £747 million in new accommodation and buildings, with the Scottish Government currently proposing, uh, indicatively at any rate, to provide not much more than half 
of that requirement. But, presiding officer, the biggest challenges lie with the workforce. Councils estimate they will need 12,000 full-time equivalent additional staff to deliver this policy. That is a 128% increase. And the truth is that the Scottish Government do not know where these staff are coming from. At First Minister's questions last week, the First Minister reeled off what she said was her plan to deliver a plan we've heard repeated by the Minister again today, increased apprenticeships and graduate places. But the trouble is, all of those measures are right here in the Audit Scotland report. But Audit Scotland simply concludes this will only provide a very small number of the additional places needed. It isn't enough. And let's be honest, this Scottish Government is to workforce planning what Eddie the Eagle is to ski jumping. When the self-same First Minister was, when the self-same First Minister, when the self-same First Minister was Health Secretary, she had, she had a plan for the nursing workforce, didn't she? And what do we have now? We have a fourfold increase in unfilled nursing posts. And in her top priority of education, she's managed the incredible outcome of losing 3,500 teachers' posts and still creating a shortage of teachers and hundreds of unfilled vacancies. There is no rational reason or credible evidence to allow us to believe that this Scottish Government can find and train 12,000 early years workers to deliver this policy. And in there, always polite and courteous and understated way. That is what Audit Scotland tells us here. <clears throat> they say, it is difficult to see how all the challenges can be overcome in the time available. Minister, you may be confident you're going to reach agreement and resolve all those challenges and it's all going to be fine. Audit Scotland is telling you they do not believe you. Not enough revenue funding, not enough capital funding, not enough staff, and not enough leadership from this government to deliver this flagship policy. That's the wake-up call. And yet this you must report conclude. delivers. The government should no, listen. No, no, please conclude. The government should please listen. Please conclude, Mr. Gray. I'm moving action. on. Uh, you were given an extra minute and the clock didn't start, in fact, until you stood up to speak. So I was quite generous. Oliver Mundell, followed by Jenny Gilruth in the open debate. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I've been extremely uh, disappointed so far with the tone uh, coming from the government. I think uh, from this side of the chamber, uh, we've already heard a very reasonable, uh, considered argument that does recognise some of the benefits of this policy and some of the success we've seen for families already and instead all we heard was uh, some moans and groans about what's happening uh, south of the border. I think it is uh, time that the Scottish Government went away and looked seriously at what members across this chamber are saying, what outside bodies with responsibility for scrutinising the government are saying, what parents uh, and families are saying and what providers and local authorities are saying. It's a bit of a coincidence that everyone else uh, feels there's a degree of doubt about the achievability of this policy, yet the government still has full confidence in itself. I do recognise that many families are benefiting already, but that whole uh, process is far too random, and in some cases it's entirely a postcode lottery. In rural communities like mine in Dumfrieshire, uh, we don't see a good uh, level of flexibility for parents. Uh, people don't have a lot of choice and uh, providers are struggling and they recognise themselves that they're struggling to deliver the quality of early years childcare and learning uh, that they wish to uh, provide and be associated with. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to have found out today that the Minister uh, has agreed to meet with me and some of those uh, private providers and voluntary providers uh, to hear some concerns uh, because I'm gravely worried uh, because all 20 uh, of our private providers 
in Dumfries and Galloway have said uh, to Dumfries and Galloway Council that they wish to halt the procurement process. Uh, they've said that because they're worried uh, they won't have capacity, that they won't have the staff uh, to deliver these policies and they've not had access to the capital funding uh, required. Yes? Gillian Martin. You, Mr Valentine, come from the same part, part of the world. Have you made representation to the Education to Committee in, in the local authority to ask why this is not happening? Mr Mundell. Uh, I thank uh, the member uh, for uh, the intervention. I would gently say uh, that people living in Dumfries and Galloway uh, would consider themselves uh, to, to come from a different part of the world than, than the Scottish borders. Uh, but um, in, in terms of approaching the council, in, 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 terms of, in terms of approaching uh, the council, in terms of approaching the council, in, in terms of approaching the council, uh, I've met with them uh, on a number of occasions. I've taken uh, council staff out to meet providers. I've facilitated uh, conversations. And I think the council have met on a number of occasions with the Scottish Government and expressed concerns. They're worried about how they're going to find enough staff for their own in-house uh, nursery provision. They're worried uh, about what this will mean uh, for, the, for, the, for the private and voluntary providers. Everyone's on exactly the same page, apart from, uh, it seems, the Scottish Government. And I think we've got to this point, uh, because this is a government that's decided to over-promise uh, with no thought uh, to, to, to how it's actually going to deliver. And it's the same issue uh, we see time and time again when it comes to, to policies that come forward. It's all very well and good uh, to, to say that things have good intentions, that things have good intentions behind them. Uh, but if they can't be delivered on the ground, all the promises and warm words are meaningless. Yeah. I'm very, very worried as well that we're seeing a fall in the number of providers. We've lost 637 uh, since this government uh, came to power. And in uh, my own hometown of Moffat, uh, we've lost the sole childcare provider there. And I've been approached by... Yes? No, I'm afraid you can't. You're in your last minute. If you do, we must stop at five minutes. Sorry, I, I thought oh, I had six minutes. Sorry. I beg your pardon, I'm dreaming. I beg your pardon. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Mundell for giving way. Uh, I share his concerns about uh, providers leaving the industry, which is why I'm so anxious to make sure that there is good dialogue between local authorities and those providers to enable there to be a role for those providers in the expansion of early learning and childcare. Does he agree with the importance of that dialogue to take place to make sure we can have breadth of provision and assist in getting a contribution to the delivery of this policy objective? Mr Mundell, I'll give you your time back then. I've no spare time after that. Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Over. I absolutely agree with that. That's why I've contacted uh, the Minister to arrange a meeting to try and uh, make sure that all parties are working together. And the, the private and voluntary sector is absolutely vital and we can't underestimate its importance because at present just one in ten uh, council nurseries are open between 8am and 6pm and certainly in Dumfries and Galloway uh, in the vast majority of communities uh, the sole uh, funded provision uh, comes from, from private and voluntary providers. That I just believe uh, that uh, they're, they're not, they don't feel uh, well supported at the moment. Uh, they feel uh, they've been asked to do something that's unrealistic. These are people who are absolutely committed uh, to this sector. They're people uh, who've juggled a lot of challenges and changes, uh, most of which they welcome and recognise are important. All they want is a fair hearing and for the government to stop and take stock of uh, the suggestions that are coming forward and the concerns that people have on a cross-party basis. I would urge uh, the government to listen and work constructively with all parties involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Jenny Gilruth, be followed by Jenny Mara. Ms Gilruth, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I remind members and appeal to the Education Secretary. Um, they're easy ozy up there, so I can just change my hours at short notice. The nursery is open all day. I can just tell them how long I want Leila to be there for. Page 24 of the Accounts Commission Report, Parent Story 18. She did start speaking just before she went to nursery and since then it's come on leaps and bounds. She's more articulate, she's using new words. Honestly, the things I don't have time to sit down and do with her on a regular basis. Parent story 26. 
The funded hours allowed me to get qualifications that I wouldn't have otherwise got. So looking for a job might be a wee bit easier because I've got qualifications. It gave me skills. It makes me feel more useful, like I can actually do something. It gives you confidence. Parent Story 21. Presiding officer, these are real examples from the Accounts Commission report. Now let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. For some parents, for some carers, for some children, this policy is working and it's working well. The government commitment to fully fund the expansion of early learning and childcare to 1,140 hours by 2020 is undoubtedly ambitious, but it's also about growing the economy. It's about tackling inequality. And crucially, it's about closing the poverty-related attainment gap, as Michelle Ballantyne alluded to in her opening statement. Indeed, the report cites the 2014 Closing the Attainment Gap study by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which found that the gap between children from low incomes and high income households can be 10 to 13 months at just age five. Today's Conservative motion begins with a recognition of the strong cross-party consensus for the expansion of childcare. And whilst there is a general agreement for the principles behind the policy, it is also clear from the Account Commission's report that individual experience of ELC provision do vary across the country. Page 28 of the report details the differing models used across the country to deliver the ELC entitlement. The part-day model, which allocates three hours and ten minutes, has remained relatively static between 2014-15 and 16-17. However, the key difference, if you look at that page, uh, highlighted is the increase in shorter part-days and longer part-days in full-day provision in additional funded hours for flexible use and in extended periods beyond the school term time. Crucially, though, more councils in 1617 were looking at a range of models. Presiding officer, I think we should all be cognizant today about the different needs of families. There can be no one size fits all approach to childcare provision. The Accounts Commission states councils do not always provide clear information to help parents understand the complex system of how ELC works. The report highlights parents and carers' confusion over the application process required for a funded place, with some administered centrally and others unclear about the use of a catchment area for nurseries. And as Parent Story 3 illustrates, it took me a few years to get him somewhere when they said that you go from uh, get a form and you put in three choices. So I put in three choices, but none of them could take him. It's just as well I went to another nursery as he still didn't get a place at any of the ones on my form. The expansion of early learning and childcare is predicated on accessibility. It is therefore absolutely essential that all local authorities ensure they have systems in place which engage parents with a wide variety of childcare options which best meet their needs. Indeed, the report furthermore highlights the differing admissions criteria used by councils, with some prioritising older children, some prioritising ASN children and others looked after children. So can I make a suggestion to the government today? that a clear commitment is given to care experience young people through the work of the care. The government is obviously committed rather to the work of the care review uh, to care experience young people. So I hope that the government will now maybe consider uh, looking at how local authorities work to prioritise children in terms of their ELC entitlements, especially those who are looked after. The report recommends that councils develop a range of ELC on offer locally in response to parental consultation and design choice around this. However, some 10 councils, including Fife Council, Murray Council, East Lothian, restrict the numbers of children they will fund and partner providers. And indeed, I've previously highlighted Fife Council's refusal to use childminders in the entitlement offered. Fife is both a rural and an urban local authority area, and childminding is a really popular method of childcare for many working parents and carers. The authority blocking this type of provision is, however, arguably limiting the potential flexibility offered by ELC. And indeed, as Maggie Simpson, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Childminders Association, told me yesterday, it certainly is not a case of simply providing more money. We need to be looking to provide a, range of ba a balanced range of places, not necessarily bigger nurseries, but the sensible use of small family-based services providing by provided by childminders that also allow, allow for outlook I just finished this bit here, outdoor learning and support for parents. This policy is not what is really at fault, but it's the implementation from local authorities. Yes, I will. Yep. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank Jenny Gilroy for taking the intervention. The SCMA say that um, some local authorities are biased towards child minders. I just wondered if uh, you believe that is true and if it is the case, how the Scottish Government can improve the relationship between child minders and the Scottish Government to enable uh, more flexible and indeed more hours uh, of childcare to be delivered. Jenny Gilruth. 
Thank you, presiding officer. I thank Rachel Hamilton for that um, intervention. I'm not necessarily sure if I can comment on whether or not they're biased. I only have experience of Fife as a Fife MSP. I know that Fife don't use it. And I think actually that if they were to invest in using childminders, we, we could move forward. Um, in October last year, the Scottish Government published an action plan to ensure that quality is at the heart of ELC provision. Now, this set out 15 actions to strengthen quality childcare provision, including promoting greater use of outdoor learning and empowering parents to make the choice of ELC setting that is right for their child. Councils, therefore, like Fife, need to reflect on how they are empowering parents and carers to have that choice. Before concluding, I want to return now to the purpose of this legislation, particularly in terms of driving productivity, because the report does acknowledge that access to childcare is a factor in helping women back into work. Women like my mum, who had to give up their careers in the 1980s to have their families because that's what was expected. And unlike their mothers, they often had to return to work as the unpaid hidden labour that they carried out in the home, providing the state with free childcare, had not allowed them to progress up the And there I'm afraid, ladder. I'm sorry, you must conclude, I did say at no time in hand, and you'd have to absorb interventions, and I'm grateful that you took one, but we have to move on. Thank Please you. sit down. Okay, I thank call you. Jenny Mara to be followed by James Dornan. Presiding officer. We are this afternoon discussing the obstacles to the expansion of childcare and what Audit Scotland have identified as the difficulties in the delivery of the increased hours. But I would like to really focus this afternoon on outcomes, as this is something that Audit Scotland have addressed in their report as well. I think there seems to be a huge gap in what we are expecting childcare to deliver and indeed how to measure that. The Audit Scotland report says that the Scottish Government failed to set out clearly the improved outcomes for children and for parents that the expansion to 600 hours was designed to achieve. Uh, Audit Scotland also says the Scottish Government did not identify what measures would indicate success or ensure baseline data was available. Presiding officer, I think this is one for me, the key questions in this report. Um, if, if childcare is really going to help uh, close the attainment gap and improve outcomes for children, not just through their childhood, but the rest of their lives, then we must find some way of measuring it and we must find some benchmarks um, to um, assure ourselves what quality childcare provision is. Now, if it is a policy aim that childcare improves outcomes for children, now this is one of the Scottish Government's policy aims stated in the document, that does accept the premise that quality of childcare improves when the parents hand the child over to the nursery or the child minder. Now, in some circumstances, this may be true, but for a society, I find it a difficult premise just to blithely accept that when the children are put into nurseries or childcare settings, that the quality of the care they get improves drastically enough to accept their outcomes. And I think it is a bit sad for our country just to blithely accept this on a policy level. Now, a few years ago, we used to be in a situation where social workers were able to support parents in their own childcare preventative work. Social workers had the time and capacity to convene parenting groups, to share techniques, play, language, games, discipline tactics for stronger parenting skills in, in, with the parents in that context. There is now, presiding officer, precious little time, if any time, for any of this work to be done in our communities. I know in Dundee that social workers are now completely consumed by high tariff statutory cases which must of course be properly and sensitively managed but it does leave that gap and that gap is supporting parents who want to upskill their own parenting skills something which I think all parents recognise that they need to do regularly. Can I also make an observation, uh, presiding officer, which may be uh, a little controversial, but just last month we got the city's report that told us that 260, I think, thousand jobs across Scotland will go by 2030 due to automation. In my own city of Dundee, 25% of jobs will disappear. Now, nobody is welcoming these figures or indeed prepared to accept an economy where the scale of this is realised. 
But what we must do is recognise that even if we try to reverse this trend or, trend or curtail it, there will be more parents in future looking after their own children. So it is vital that we support more parenting work in that context and in a preventative context to support them to achieve their own aspirations of the highest quality of care. But if I can turn, presiding officer, back to outcomes in a childcare setting, I think the government must strive to continually improve the quality of childcare. Audit Scotland points out that the Scottish Government stresses the importance of high quality childcare but fails to define high quality. Now, is this not a huge omission in policy making? I know myself that when choosing childcare, quality was one of my highest priorities. So why is there no benchmark for this, for parents that are making these choices all over the country? Can I conclude, presiding officer, by drawing the minister's attention to the fact that in Dundee, the council still doesn't know what their funding for capital and revenue 1819 will be, uh, as the Scottish Government has not decided on its distribution by local authority. Perhaps the minister can up date me on that today. I'm happy to take an intervention if that's well, the case. Well, you are in your last minute and you're getting no extra time, so it's up to you. Perhaps the Minister will up update it in his own speech later. Um, but overall, I think the, the Audit Scotland has given the Government a stark warning, not just on implementation of ours, but on the policy objectives behind childcare and how we improve quality and measure outcomes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whoops. Thank you very much. I now call James Dornan to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, whilst recognising the concerns raised by the Auditor General, I'd like to start by welcoming the positive comments in the Audit Scotland report on expanding childcare from the existing 600 to 1140 hours. I also welcome the cross-party support shown to the principle of the policy across this chamber, given the huge importance of this proposal. Although the contrib contribution by Mr Gray was his usual ray of sunshine in an Eddie the Eagle type way, of course, lots of complaining, no positive suggestions how we could improve the rollout of this important policy. There is, a, still there, Ian? there is absolutely no doubt that the role of the parent has changed. We're long gone from the days where the male worked and the female stayed at home with the children. Families have changed. Work patterns have changed and the needs of childcare have, of course, changed alongside this. Given the cross-party support previously mentioned, I've no doubt that every member across this chamber recognises that childcare is a huge barrier which prevents many women and indeed men returning to the workplace. Many parents and guardians who would have at one point sought out childcare from older relatives, such as aunts, uncles and grandparents, find that with the pensionable age constantly increasing, this is no longer a viable option for most households. So Scottish Government has set out a further plan to rectify some of these many issues, which not only prevent parents seeking gainful employment, but would also mean a sure start for our young children. And you'll note my use of the word plan. And just like any plan and or major project, the early days require a lot of work, investigative process and adjustments. And it's clear the Scottish Government are taking a responsible approach to implementing this policy. There are very positive conversations taking place with local authorities and producing a multi-year funding package. And of course, it is not unusual, actually it's extremely common, at this point in the life of a major project for people to have different ideas as to the final costs. What is not in doubt is that the Scottish Government has pledged to fully fund this policy. The Scottish Government is working towards having full agreement with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on the matter by the end of April. Now, during its consideration of the draft budget, the Education and Skills Committee, of which I am convener, explored the expansion of early years with the Cabinet Secretary for Education. Among other things, we asked them about funding to support the expansion and upskilling of the early years workforce. Also, in the Committee's concluding letter on the draft budget, we asked the Scottish Government for more details than the number of qualified teachers in the early years workforce that would be supported in the 2018-19 budget. Looking forward, the Committee is holding a series of evidence sessions with Ministers in March, and Audit Scotland's overview of the early years sector will be very valuable context for this. The Committee will be hearing from the Auditor General on 21st of March, and that session will be followed directly by evidence from the Minister for Early Years and Childcare. 
The committee will be looking for questions from individuals and stakeholders through social media for the session with the Minister. So, Minister, you've got that to look forward to in the early part of March. So, as you can see, the Parliament, at least through my committee, will be keeping a close watch on the progress of the expansion of childcare. Having previously commended the Conservatives for their support and principle to the expanded target, I really still have to make comment on the difference between the way this government is supporting early years compared to the party of government of which she is the, the member is a member. The early years national funding formula intended to abolish the funding disparity across England has in fact reduced the average nursery's budget by £13,000 due to Westminster's underfunding. A nursery owner said, let's not be lectured on well thought out policies that are beautifully executed by the Tories when counties such as Suffolk are seeing preschool establishments resorting to bucket collections and are likely to see the closure of many early learning establishments. No, there's no time for, for uh, interventions, unfortunately. I understand that there is concern around funding, but this project is, as I've stated several times, ambitious. It's, it's absolutely fair to say that there will be need to be a sufficient amount of groundwork and research done to ensure we can meet the proposals as set out. But this government has pledged to do just that. So while I accept there's much to do to achieve our ambitious targets, it's clear that this government is serious about making life better for our children and families. And I'd have been happier to hear our opponents come up with practical ways in which we could have helped to achieve this rather than suggest we postpone it until some unknown date in the future. The expansion of childcare to three and four year olds and eligible two year olds has been welcomed by parents, caregivers and educators across Scotland. It's about time that all parties come together to ensure we deliver it. And actually, I see that I do have a wee bit of time and I'm more than happy to take an intervention if you wish. Liam Kerr. Thank you. I'll try and remember. Um, just, you were talking, Mr Dornan, about the UK government. Uh, so can I ask Mr Dornan whether he welcomes the UK government's scheme of tax-free childcare, which can save parents up to £2,000 a year in childcare costs? Mr Dornan. That's part of the whole overall package that has ended up with many of these nurseries and early years places closing. So anything that's going to benefit parents would, of course, be welcomed by anybody. And if it even comes from the UK government, it may well be a surprise to most people, it still would be welcomed by us. And on that note, I suspect I will close down and support the government's amendment. Thank you. Uh, Alison Johnson to be followed by Tavish Scott. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Convener. Um, research has shown that the greatest rate of child development occurs in the first five years of life. By the age of three, almost half of our language capacity is in place. And by the age of five, when many children first enter primary school, that figure is as high as 85%. The evidence from psychology, neuroscience and biology is clear. Our experiences in our early years are the greatest determinant of our capacity to grow into confident, resilient adults who are able to handle life's ups and downs. And that's why the expansion of free childcare is hugely welcome, but only when it is high quality. Um, and I have some sympathy with um, uh, the points Jenny Mara raises um, regarding support for parents um, looking after their own children. Now, clearly, this is a really ambitious move for, from the government in terms of the scale of change needed in the Scottish early years and childcare sector. And this goes some way to explaining some of the problems raised in the Audit Scotland report mentioned in the motion. On the issue of staffing, the Scottish Government has estimated that between about 6,000 and 8,000 whole-time equivalent additional staff will be needed to deliver the expansion by 2020, but councils estimate that 12,000 might be closer to the mark. So this is a huge increase. Um, Audit Scotland in their report shows that pay for childcare staff is substantially lower in the private partner provider sector. The average salary for practitioners in local authority settings is estimated at 28,000, but it is only 15,000 in partner provider settings. On average, for an early years practitioner, the public sector spends two thirds more than the voluntary and 80% more than the private sector on staff related costs such as wages and pensions. The same report says that that, that might be explained by the higher proportion of practitioners who are still in training in the partner provider sector, but the matter is far too important simply to theorise about, because as welcome as it is, we don't want the expansion of free childcare to be delivered 
by increasing the number of low-paid childcare workers who lack good pensions, decent pay, and the vast majority of whom are women. So I think shortages in the care sector too will impact on staffing in this sector. And, and these are issues I'd like the Minister to address in closing. Um, in particular, how she will ensure that the recruitment of the additional staff needed will be done in concert with the Scottish Government's fair work principles. This, this is really important work. It should be highly valued and well paid. Um, I warmly welcome Jenny Garuth's support for childminders. I think the recruitment of more childminders will be crucial to ensuring the 1140 hours can be delivered to everyone. Childminders, I feel, and uh, I know this from experience, um, they feel sometimes that they're treated like the poor relation within early years in childcare within the sector, but they can offer excellent care and do so with great flexibility. So I really think this is an area that needs focused on. Um, I'm pleased that Audit Scotland estimate that childminders will deliver 6.5% of total funded hours for eligible two-year-olds by 2020-21, compared to just 1.6% in 2016-17. And on that issue of eligible two-year-olds, um, Daniel Johnston raised the low take-up of the means-tested entitlement for some two-year-olds. He's right to state that about 10% of all two-year-olds were registered for funded ELC in September 2017, less than half of the 25% who are entitled. And the report suggests that registration figures don't include two-year-old provision offered through childminders, and that councils don't get information from DWP and HMRC about eligible children in their areas. Um, the Minister has addressed this to some extent, but I would be interested to hear exactly what the Minister is doing to access UK Government data for this purpose, especially as this was recommended to the Scottish Government in a report it commissioned as a major priority in March last year. I don't think these are insurmountable problems and I'd, interest, I'd be interested to hear what the Government is doing to resolve them. The same research shows that both parents and professionals identified that personal contact and relationships with health visitors and other professionals and with friends who used free LC was key to promoting the provision and encouraging take up. And that very much chimes with the Healthier Wealthier Children project now being rolled out nationally, which has helped parents access thousands of pounds a year by training health visitors and midwives to signpost to benefit advice. I think there's a real opportunity here for the new social security system, as some of the new forms of assistance being established are similarly means tested. Ministers have pledged to increase take-up of benefits by raising awareness and helping people to apply for what they're eligible for. So there are lessons to be learned from the lower than desirable take-up, um, you, you know, and looking at what we could do about the two-year-old's offer. Because it has been agreed within this parliament that this is a group of our youngest citizens who really would benefit from earlier introduction to early learning and childcare. And clearly too many of them aren't accessing that provision. So as well as the total amount of childcare and its flexibility and accessibility, we should use this rollout to explore new innovative models of childcare. Um, the City of Edinburgh Council, as the Minister notes, has been piloting the forest kindergarten approach. Um, and children spending the, the majority of time outdoors in a woodland setting, learning through, exploring through nature. I, I did see the photos, you're clearly having um, a fun day, but I'd like the Minister to touch on you know, what more innovation could be introduced to this sector so that it is as fulfilling as possible for, for those receiving it, for those delivering it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tavish Scott, followed by Rona Mackay. Mr Scott, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I um, take Alison Johnson's point about child minding based on the end of schools being closed tomorrow, as she will well know as well. The, um, I, I've been doing a bit of child minding arrangements on the text in the last half hour or so, which I'm probably not allowed to do, but uh, hey-ho, um, these things have to, be, uh, have to be done. And at the moment, the choice seems to be sledging down Arthur's seat or organising five-a-side football in the garden lobby. So we'll see, uh, we'll, see how, uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm still trying to make the comparison between the first Minister and Eddie the Eagle, but I haven't quite got there uh, uh, yet. So, um, uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, I wanted to just, um, I just wanted to uh, take the uh, theme of this debate um, uh, as the vision and ambition around expanding childcare, which few, if any, would disagree with. Uh, compared to the policy's implementation. And what I hope that the government's front bench would, ex would expect and indeed understand is that uh, for many of us, uh, certainly, in, certainly in this party, uh, we're absolutely with the government on, on the vision of what uh, 
is sought to achieve here in expanding childcare for all the right reasons, and many colleagues from across the Parliament have set out, I think, um, the cogent arguments uh, uh, as to why that is the case. And indeed, the Minister, I think, rightly mentioned the international research that exists in that, and that shouldn't be discounted. That's actually pretty important stuff as well. But that does differ from the policies of implementation. And I think many of us, irrespective of where we are uh, and, and which part of Scotland we represent, um, do have some concerns uh, which uh, I think are fair and do need to be articulated in Parliament. Uh, and Audit, uh, Audit Scotland and the Auditor General are not to be in any way dismissed on that one because what they did was to bring most of that uh, together in, in the report that was published just a few weeks ago. Now, I understand uh, the point the, the government make about the financial gap between councils and, and, and the government. That, of course, uh, will exist. But there are a number of steps behind that which I just want to touch on, which I hope would, they would ex uh, would concede are important in, in resolving that gap, in making sure that these things are brought together. Uh, some councils only received the revenue letters for the 18-19 financial year last Friday. And as yet, and I'm very happy to be corrected on this, they haven't yet had confirmation on the capital that they are to receive for the 18-19 financial year. And I hope again the government would accept, the front bench would accept, uh, that it is difficult, uh, particularly on the capital side, to plan effective uh, spend and indeed value for money uh, if the uh, indicative or indeed the actual amount that they are due to receive has yet to be, uh, has yet to be forthcoming. Of course. John Swiddy. I'm grateful to Mr Scott for giving me, it gives me a chance to address the point that Jenny Mara raised. Uh, the resource allocations uh, have been made and agreed with, and distributed to local authorities. Um, the capital allocations we were requested, these issues are discussed within the settlement and distribution group which involves local authorities. Now, local authorities asked us not to distribute the capital allocations until we've made further progress in the res resolution of the individual plans by local authorities. So the government has said there's £150 million on the table able to be allocated, but we've been asked not to allocate that at this stage by the Settlement and Distribution Group. So the government would happily allocate it today, but we're not being encouraged to do so. Tavis Scott. That, that may, and I'm sure Mr Swinney might accept this, uh, might show the difference between individual local authorities and COSLA as a whole. Um, and I, 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 well, he can shake his, shake his hands around it as much as he likes. Um, the, the fact is that I'm, I'm not criticising the government here. I, I don't understand why John gets so worked up on the front bench. But, he, but uh, the, the fact is that... Uh, the, <laughs> the fact is that uh, some councils uh, are simply making the case, which I think is a pretty reasonable one, uh, that if, if they have not received their capital allocations, and this is now the end of February, uh, to make and plan capital projects in the next financial year is, I think, a reasonably tall order. Uh, so if COSLA are saying, and I'll be again happy to check this with COSLA myself, if COSLA are saying that they, as Mr Swinney has just said, don't want those capital allocations until the plans are finished, then I'll be interested to hear that argument. But I think it's also important to separate, the point I wanted to make, separate out the 1819 financial year and the implementation of 1819 from the three-year funding deal uh, that has yet to be resolved. Uh, and that, the First Minister made clear last Thursday, is due to be uh, concluded by the end of a April. And therefore, it is assumed councils will hear what that is in, uh, in May. Now, the point about that, uh, which I do think is, uh, is important, is that the three-year allocation will give some basis for both the longer-term capital allocations that are necessary uh, to make in order to meet the objective of expanding childcare in terms of the provision, uh, but also the revenue amounts, which of course relate to the workforce, and the point that many colleagues have made about the uh, scale of the workforce uh, challenge. And the bit I haven't uh, understood, um, uh, both as a member of the Education Committee that uh, James Dornan mentioned earlier on, is that when um, Mr Swinney and indeed uh, the previous minister gave evidence to the uh, Scottish Parliament Education Committee, I believe they led the evidence that we expected there to be 12,000 staff needed across the whole uh, sector. Uh, now, we can all go and check the official report afterwards. Now, the number that is now being presented is very much less than that. And I would be very grateful if in the wind-up that uh, the, the government are going to make today and the final speech the government are going to make today, they would set out indeed what uh, that difference is and why, when not at Scotland, conclude as they have uh, that that figure seems to be so uh, far apart. Part. The final um, observation I'd make is that the recommendation that, the, that Audit Scotland made, which appears to me the most important one, is that to both government and to the councils, is that uh, they must urgently finalise and implement plans for changes to the workforce and infrastructure that are necessary for the delivery of this report. To do that in the timescale uh, that is, is necessary is, is exacting but must be achieved. 
call Rona Mackay to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. Everyone in this chamber wants the best start in life for our children and appreciates how crucial it is that children are given quality, flexible, affordable care as early as possible. Doubling entitlement to free early learning to 11.40 hours per year by 2020 for all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds provides an, provides an historic opportunity in Scotland. Quite simply, no other policy has such potential to transform the lives of children and their families while improving the prospects of Scotland's economy in the short and long term, as acknowledged by Michelle Ballantyne in her opening speech. Of course, achieving this vision and reshaping how we care for our children cannot happen overnight. Of course, it requires substantial increases in the workforce and investment in infrastructure, as well as new, innovative and flexible models of delivery. If concerns are raised by stakeholders, then of course it's right that they are listened to and we address those concerns. That's why we're working collaboratively, collaboratively with those in the early learning profession and with local authorities to make this work. Why on earth would we jeopardise this historic chance to put Scotland on a progressive, groundbreaking path by simply ignoring those people who we depend upon to make it work? Answer, we will not. We are engaged in meaningful dialogue with all concerned parties. We are listening and will act on any concerns. It's in no one's interest not to. That's why I'm dismayed and a bit depressed by the opposition's negative approach to this fantastic initiative. Instead of welcoming such a transformative plan, they instead choose to play politics with it and dish out their SNP bad card. The recently published Audit Scotland report recognises the Scottish Government and councils have worked well together to expand provision. Yes. Michelle Thank Ballantyne. You. Thank you. Does the member recognise that the figures we've brought up today on all sides of the chamber and the concerns we have raised were contained in the report by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission? This is not playing politics. This is visiting some very real concerns by people outside of politics who are looking independently at what's going on. Rona Mackay. Yes, I, I understand that. But that's why we are stressing that we are working and we are listening to them. It's important that we do that. We're not dismissing them, but we just think the negativity might not be helpful. Uh, well, there has, actually. Um, the recently published Audit Scotland report recognises the Scottish Council, Government and Councils have worked well together to expand provision. Parents are positive about the benefits. In summer, I received several emails from concerned parents whose children were about to begin attending a nursery in my constituency, which is piloting the 1140 hours scheme. Their concerns reflected the issues contained in Michelle Ballantyne's motion. However, I'm pleased to say that all of their fears were unfounded by the time their children began nursery last August. When I visited the nursery just after the term had begun, I learned that the concerns parents had had at the outset were also shared by staff, but they, they had worked alongside the local authority during the summer to eradicate these issues, which were no longer problematic by the time the term began. Parents then reported to me increased flexibility, huge savings in childcare costs, and amazing benefits to their children's social development. So the government is working with councils to help them develop their expansion plans, and they recently reached agreement with COSLA to agree the multi-year funding needed. As the First Minister outlined at FMQs last week, plans to a full agreement with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities uh, on the matter by the end of April. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is striving to make Scotland the best country in the world for a child to grow up in. Policies like the baby box, the expansion of the early years provision are paramount to that and are crucial in growing our economy, closing the attainment gap and tackling inequality. Yes, there will be challenges and difficulties along the way, as there would be with any scheme as ambitious as this one. But the Scottish Government is on track to deliver by the, their target date of 2020. That has not changed. Also, what hasn't changed is the saving of 4,500 per child per year to Scottish families. Of course, we've invested in early years apprentices with a record number expected to start this year and will recruit, plans are to recruit 20,000 new practitioners. Presiding officer, I said in the last debate we had an early years provision, and I'm happy to say again, early years practitioners are not glorified babysitters. They're skilled, qualified workers doing one of the most important jobs there is. Jenny Mara rightly asked about the quality of childcare. 
And like Alison Johnson, I agree that support to parents at home is, is vital and should be considered. But the new practitioners will learn about the importance of the attachment-led ethos about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, which can affect every aspect of a young person's life. Their skill and knowledge will enrich our children's lives. So our programme is not all about quantity, it's about quality first and foremost. And childminders too must be a pivotal part of the initiative. To address Alison Johnson's point, fair pay is also at the heart of our plans. We will enable payment of the living wage to all childcare staff delivering the funding entitlement by 2020. So look at our record. Since the SNP came to power, we've increased nursery entitlement by 45% for three, four and vulnerable two-year-olds, saving families so far up to £2,500 a year. But a bit like Groundhog Day, the opposition told us then we couldn't deliver it, but we did. And let's not forget the purpose of the policy is to improve the experience in the early years of our children and to prepare them for the school years and beyond. And it's about helping parents to work without having massive childcare costs to, to pay. I urge the opposition to work with us on this, not to be negative from the sidelines and shout SNP bad. This is about our children and our grandchildren's futures. You must close. And it's more important than politics. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Everyone in this Parliament agrees that uh, childcare is of utmost importance. Good quality childcare is crucial for our children's development. The SNP will tell us that their plans to double free childcare are ambitious. Indeed, they may be well ambitious, but ambition doesn't mean that the SNP government should not listen to those who have raised concerns. For what this SNP government needs is an achievable ambition, and what that means in simple terms is an ability to listen to constructive criticism and act accordingly. I know that the SNP do not like taking lectures from the Tories, another favoured phrase, but Deputy Presiding Officer, will they take lessons from Audit Scotland, who have said that there are significant risks in the implementation of their childcare plans? And figures compiled from the Care Inspectorate, early learning and childcare statistics, show that childcare availability for poorer families has decreased, whilst for more affluent families it is increasing. The findings demonstrate that in 2013 there were 54.4 childcare providers per 10,000 residents in Scotland for the most deprived families, which shrank to 53.6 by 2017. This is in stark contrast to the least deprived families, where in 2013 the figure was 107.3, and last year that figure rose to 110.3. This is a significant issue, as the evidence suggests that the gap starts in preschool and only widens throughout the years, making the attainment gap even harder to close. There is another reason why it beggars belief that childminders have been sidelined throughout their expansion plans, when they should be utilising them to ensure every parent has full, flexible and high-quality childcare. I certainly will. John Swinney. I'm, I'm grateful to Rachel Hamilton because my purpose of my intervention to Oliver Mundell was to stress the, the diversity of provision that we're interested in encouraging. And indeed, in the pilots that we've undertaken, 10 of the 14 trials involve childminders. Now, that's hardly sidelining childminders when we've actually provided for 10, for in 14 trials, 10 of them to include childminders to make sure they're central to the delivery of this policy. Rachel Hamilton. I disagree with John Swinney. Um, the figures I've been looking at have uh, looked at uh, 6,000 childminders across Scotland and only 100 being included within the partnership process but we can argue over those figures but what the Scottish Borders Council is saying is that the child mind to support over 800 families offering them care all year round including the elusive hours of before and after school as well as during holiday times and this flexibility is crucial for working parents I hope going forward even though uh, John Swinney is trying to defend uh, the, the pilot projects and the, the partnership that have been going on within those pilot, pilot projects is able to listen to the concerns of childminders. As I said, just 100 of those 6,000 childminders in Scotland are being commissioned by local authorities to deliver funded childcare. This highlights a serious issue with the delivery. It represents another example of the SNP government committed to an idea, but not the delivery. Audit Scotland makes it clear that the SNP government did not carefully consider delivery because identi identi sorry, 
I will quote, identify measures of success before committing almost 650 million to the increase, making it difficult to assess whether it is delivering value for money. And they also said, and agreed to the expansion without evidence that it would achieve the desi desired outcome for children and parents, without considering other ways of achieving those objectives. You can make an intervention, um, but that was a quote. Marie Todd. Can I ask you whether the Conservative Party do support this expansion or don't they support this expansion? As far as I can hear from you, you're saying we'll, we think it's a great idea, but hang on, do it in the future, let's research it a bit more. Um, your budget proposals have taken 500 million out of the... Um, <laughs> out of the budget, you're not willing to fund it, you don't think it's affordable, you don't agree with universality. Can you make that clear, please? Rachel Hamilton. <laughs> the, uh, what Audit Scotland said is that the SNP's expansion of 600 hours of funding provision was done, and this is the 600 hours, was done without considering the range of different options to improve outcomes for children and parents. The lack of foresight to even explore alternative me methods is characteristic of the SNP government deciding on an end goal and pursuing it regardless of the costs or results. If you disagree with Audit Scotland, then, you know, please speak to them and, and write to them. These are glaring omissions and show a real lack of focus when it comes to trying to fulfil what the SNPs have themselves described as a flagship policy. The Scottish borders are already struggling to deliver childcare, will again struggle to meet the SNPs' aims. But this is not... Could I just speak, please? Um, this... Could we stop the shouting from but city positions? But this is not positions. a problem that will only be felt in the Scottish borders. Graeme Sharp, chair of the Accounts Commission, said, the scale of change needed over the next two years is considerable, and there are significant risks that councils will be unable to deliver that change in the time available. There is now an urgent need for plans addressing increases in the childcare workforce and changes to premises to be finalised and put in place. And yet we have nothing that resembles a plan. The report also found that parents said funded ELC had a limited impact on their ability to work due to the hours available and the way in which those hours were provided. And concerns were also raised that increasing infrastructure to the required levels and increasing the workforce in the short time available will be difficult to achieve. In fact, Audit Scotland have said the SNP government should have started the detailed planning with councils earlier, giving the scale of the changes required. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives do have a plan, and a cunning plan at that. Scottish Conservatives want to see parents have access to free hours of childcare wherever and whenever they clip. want. The childcare system to be much more flexible and responsible, responsive to you, parental demand. The focus should no, be No, you must close, please, Ms close. Hamilton. I will sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I have Gillian Martin, please, to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. For me, the policy in doubling free childcare in Scotland is potentially the most transformative policy of this government for families, education and the economy. Is the plan bold? Yes. Is it challenging to affect such a massive change? Absolutely. But in my experience, the things that make the biggest difference are the hardest to achieve. Better provision of high quality and flexible early years education and childcare is at the heart of every piece of evidence given to every inquiry into the gender pay gap, the inequality of women, household income, and the attainment and well-being of our children. It's the key part in the jigsaw of unlocking our children's potential, our country's economic potential, and providing quality of life for families. And it's the part of the SNP manifesto that I genuinely think is the most transformative. And it, it recognises the... Ex Would you like to let me get started, Mr Kerr? And then I'll maybe take you in later. It recognises that there are short shortcomings of the existing provision, which Jenny Govers rightly pointed out, varies from local authority to local authority. But I totally agree that flexibility must be inbuilt. If I take my own situation, I absolutely I chose to go with childminders and nursery provision as a combination for my children, because that's what worked for me, that's what worked for them, and that fitted in, that fitted in with me and my husband's uh, jobs. But something so transformational is not going to be easy to put into place. But succeed it must. And that's why I'm looking at the Conservative Party motion today. And I'm accepting that I hope they, their criticism is constructive and well-meaning. And that they want to see this government's endeavour succeed. Mr Kerr, if you want to give me an intervention there, I'm happy to take one. Liam Kerr. I, I do thank Gillian Martin. I, I don't necessarily disagree 
uh, with, with the, the setup. Um, but does the member agree with me that the SNP government does appear to have failed to model the transformational impact and the economic impact, the, the, the markers of success when it was bringing in the 600 hours? Gillian Martin. I probably place less importance on that than actually delivering it. I mean, we're working with councils to deliver it. We've got a bold ambition. We want to get it done in a, a, a timescale that's going to be meaningful for families who've got children now. So I'm not totally hung up on this. I'm more hung up on the fact, no, I'm not going to take another intervention because I've taken one already and I've got lots to say. I would be delighted if today's motion signals a change in Conservative Party policy across the UK because my brother and his wife are considering starting a family and they look to us and they think, I wish that we could have a commitment towards cheap free childcare um, for us. Um, but maybe, you know, I, I think a change in direction in helping women across the UK from the toilets is long overdue, but maybe it's just too difficult, maybe it's just too radical. I mean, Michelle Ballantyne seems to think so. She wants us to sort of like take a step back and do lots of reviews and audits over it. Well, thank goodness, thank goodness we've got the can-do Marie Todd leading this programme. So the picture is one that I don't recognise, frankly, that's coming from the Conservative benches. In my area of Aberdeenshire, I'd like to tell you about what's going on there. They are making preparations for the flexible 1140 hours, and they're well underway through a range of partnership approaches between childminders, private nurseries, Aberdeenshire Council-run nurseries, colleges and schools. And innovative approaches are also being considered. For example, Geary Sports Centre in Inverurie, which is a community-led organisation, are gearing up to provide childcare to meet the demands of the target from my area. They already provide after-school care, but they're currently expanding in recruiting. I mean, I was the chair of my local after-school club for three years, and the facilitation of the expansion of clubs like these could be a real focus for taking an existing facility and talent base and realising its potential. In the next few weeks, Aberdeenshire Council expansion plans will begin to release additional places, starting with nine local school settings and focusing on those who need it most. And during the next academic session, they hope to add an additional 20 settings, meaning that 30% of local authority nurseries will be offering 1140 places well ahead of the 2020 deadline. And we, of course, need more people to consider childcare as a career, both adults transitioning from other careers and young people assessing options for their future. And as members will know, I worked at North East Scotland College for many years, and I'm encouraged to hear of their plans to train many of the North East childcare workforce, which, of course, they have a very long history of doing, and they're at the forefront in ensuring that we have the highly qualified workforce we need. NESCOL is a key partner in the Early Education and Childcare Academy due to be launched on the 6th of March at the Beach Ballroom in Aberdeen. The Academy is made up of representatives from Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire Councils, as well as Murray Council, SDS, partners from private nurseries, senior schools, North East Scotland College and uh, University of Aberdeen. And already extensive work has been carried out to create a one-stop shop to allow anyone interested in a career in the early years to quickly access the information they need. And it will help to show the flexible nature of training and education in the area, as well as how to progress in the industry. And NESCOL have created an additional class of HNC childhood practice. They've got, currently got 60 students, and they reckon at least 50 of them will move directly into employment. But can I end on a personal note? My own 14-year-old daughter is currently applying for work experience and has expressed an interest in early years uh, education. So I'm hoping that she could be one of the highly qualified workforce of childcare professionals delivering this key government policy. I would be really proud if she did that. I think that's testament to her own childminders and our own nursery teachers. Uh, Carol Marshall, Susan Steen, Mr. Mrs. Forsyth and Mrs. Uh, Thou, who still in her mind meant so much to her and delivered her early years education. But maybe a debate on how we can encourage more you young must men close, into childcare is what we should be having. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It, it's with a, a degree of irony and indeed guilt that I'm standing up speaking in a childcare debate on, a, on to, a, a day like today because my wife is at home, working from home, looking after our two daughters because both the school and nursery that we use are closed. But it does, I think, underline one brutal reality. While we talk about flexibility of childcare, there is one brutal bottom line of inflexibility in that you have to provide childcare, that you have to look after your children, 
and therefore you must flex your work around whatever childcare arrangements you have available to them, whatever they may be. And so in that sense, that is why it impacts so hugely and so significantly on equalities issues, because unless you have access to a, a quality, affordable childcare, you cannot work. And so therefore, if you cannot work, then that will impact on, on, on the, the, the means that your family has available to them and indeed whether or not your family is in poverty or not. And likewise, we've heard many speakers talk about the attainment gap and the impact that, that the early years education can have on that. So that is why this issue is so important. And indeed, uh, Ian Gray touched upon the Independent Commission on Child Care Reform. And I think we should always look back to their recommendations. And they recommended 50 hours a week, year round of childcare, capped with a sliding scale so that childcare costs didn't exceed a proportion of family income. But most importantly, they discussed or they recommended that, that childcare be flexible to parental need to remove the stress of mixed provision. And I say that because I think that should be our benchmark. That should be our ambition. And to those people who have decried the opposition benches for being critical or negative, can I just say this? We make our comments not because we want to see the government fail. We say these things because we want the government to succeed. We make the criticisms and comments we make not because we think this is easy. We know it's hard, but we know that you need to be serious and have clear and coherent plans if you're going to be successful. But above all else, we want, we want to see the government bring forward those plans, to have those credible proposals, to make sure that we see the investment we need and importantly have the measurable outcomes that we can measure them against. Because there is an issue in terms of the progress and the reality of what's been delivered so far under the government's proposals. And yes, the 600 hours has delivered a great deal, but ask any childcare provider, ask any parent, and they will say that what is provided is welcome, but there's the reality of funding, the reality of availability, the reality of flexibility. Now, there's two key components in terms of the way that childcare is delivered. The, the, those components being partnership nurseries and local fund, authority funded nurseries. And there are issues in both of those sectors. Now, if you speak to anyone in the, 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 the partner provider sector, they will tell you, first and foremost, don't call them free hours. They're not free, they're funded. And the reality is when you look at the breakdown of the funding, and the NDNA figures are clear, that £3.64 uh, for per child per hour, when you're looking at staff ratios of 4 to 1 and you're having to pay the living wage, it's pretty obvious you're not going to be left with much over. And indeed, the NDNA state that for every three and four year old uh, looked after uh, in a, a, a partnership provided nursery, that they make a loss of £1,000 per year. And indeed, this is critically important because partner providers are 20 to 30 percent of provision. They are a critical part of this expansion. But likewise, local authority provision has issues and constraints, and particularly around flexibility. And at Fair Funding for Our Kids um, findings showed that one in ten uh, local authority nurseries don't go beyond the hours of nine to five. That it's marked by fixed slots of morning or afternoon sessions. And indeed, last year, um, I, I showed uh, figures from the Financial Review of Childcare, which showed that over half of local authorities couldn't even provide lunch. So the reality on the ground is, as while we talk about flexibility, that's flexibility that parents have to provide around the provision that's available to them. It's not flexibility for parents. And that is why uh, Fair Funding for Our Kids found that 40% of parents are dissatisfied with their childcare arrangements. So I think we should welcome the Audit Scotland uh, report because it confirms many of these findings that many of us have been trying to raise in this chamber for a number of months and indeed years. And it reinforces them. It reinforces the inf inflexibility that many find in the system. It reinforces the complexity that many find. And indeed, when we look at the take-up rates for two-year-olds, we, we see the real issues in terms of the actual provision of what is being intended. But above all else, I think one of the, 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 the starkest findings in the Audit Scotland is that we don't actually know how many three and four-year-olds are actually benefiting because of the double counting that's taking place in, in uh, the government's own figures, which is why Audit Scotland were led to conclude that the impact of the expansion on outcomes for children is unclear and the Scottish uh, government did not plan on how to evaluate this. And they went further saying there is no evidence that additional investment has improved the quality of ELC services. Those are, I think, concerning and worrying insights. And, we, and the reason they are worrying because the expansion of, uh, to, to 1140 hours is hugely uh, 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 ambitious and almost doubling of the capacity. 
But one for Audit Scotland are clear. There are shortcomings both in terms of the recruitment of people, where the Minister herself acknowledged that 11,000 additional staff are required, but we know that Scottish Funding Council are only, have only brought on 1,000 additional extra places. We need to be training 4,000 people a year on the basis of the Minister's own uh, assessments, but we are going to be short by almost two-thirds unless we do something radical in the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah. And likewise on buildings, we are almost short by half in terms of capital expenditure. Yeah. You must close, please. Well, I will close on that note. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I call Bob Doris to be followed by Liam Kerr. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. I've actually, despite some of the, the, the to and throwing of the debate, I've actually quite enjoyed the debate. You, you wouldn't know actually by the tone of it from time to time that actually the Scottish Government amendment doesn't delete one word of the motion we're debating here today. So there's actually a lot of agreement in this chamber. Not that you would know it, the, some political snowballs been thrown back and forward, and I think we can, we can perhaps appreciate that. Now, one of the issues that's been raised is uh, within the substantive motion is difference in estimated costs in relation to, to planning for this childcare strategy in terms of revenue and of capital. It's worth noting in the, the financial year about to commence that there's £243 million additional money been put into uh, to childcare. An additional £54 million specifically in relation to, to workforce and £150 million to build the bricks and mortar and renovate much of the fabric of the estate out there and some of that might go completely lost within this debate. On top of that, there's yet again an additional £52.2 million to local authorities for revenue. Actually, by 2021, with indicative budgets already, that will be a doubling of childcare investment to £840 million by that year. By any, by any quantum whatsoever, that's a huge, significant, massive investment in the sector. And let's Let's not forget that. Now, now, it is only fair to say that if the Tories have a cunning plan in relation to childcare, it can't actually be to the £500 million out the Scottish budget. There's no credibility for the Conservative Party in relation to this debate. But I've got a better plan. Let's not do the Baldrick Tory plan. Let's do the Jerry Maguire plan. Because Jerry Maguire said, show me the money. And the Tories won't show how they will raise one single penny for childcare. They just want to cut, cut, cut and promise the earth. Now that's a political snowball back towards the Conservatives, but they have no credibility within this debate. Now, let's look at actually the monies that it does take in relation to uh, build the fabric of childcare. Now, I convened the Local Government and Communities Committee, and I have to say, I, I'm getting, I've been here long enough now to know that governments, including SNP governments, seek to fund as efficiently as possible any new initiatives they give local authorities. But I also know that local authorities like to maximise the projected costs. So you get a low-end projection, you get a top-end projection, and they eventually get there. They eventually get there. And I trust that's what will happen on this occasion. That's not just the responsibility of the Scottish Government, but also of COSLA and individual local authorities. I am confident we will get there. We do need more information in multi-year budgets. Of course, we're hoping that blockage that uh, the Deputy First Minister mentioned in relation to allocations across local authorities for the coming financial year could not just be unblocked for this financial year, but those multi-year indicator budgets for the three years ahead to let them go on with the planning. I'd be quite keen to hear about that in some of the summing up. I'd also be quite keen to know about the massive amounts of capital expenditure going to local authorities, how partner third sector organisations might actually be able to bid for some of that to invest in their business to develop extra childcare capacity in the partner nursery sector. So I'd quite like to hear more information in relation to that from the government. Also much has been made about a cost benefit analysis, if you like, in relation to the money we're investing in childcare. And I appreciate that's vitally important for aud auditing purposes and it's vitally important for accounting purposes, but actually, we know the benefit of good quality childcare. So putting auditing and accounting to one side, not dismissing it, the government should address those issues, but let's look at the benefits that it brings. And I'm actually minded uh, in relation to Sir Harry Burns, uh, the former chief medical officer in relation to the benefit of pro-health 
opportunities. Harry used to be his wit's end about give us more evidence, give us, give us more evidence. He just said, we know what works, can we get on and do it? And I think that's what Gillian Martin was, was saying. So if it's good enough for Harry Burns, it's certainly good enough for me in relation uh, to, to, to this. Now, uh, in terms of measuring the quality of childcare or the benefits of childcare, I think Jenny Mara had some really quite important points to say in relation to that. It's absolutely right. Uh, we, need to, we, we need to look at that quality of care. From my personal experience, uh, my two-year-old wee boy does one day, so does one day at nursery, uh, and, and I have to say, we have seen him go on leaps and bounds in terms of his socialising with, with other, other kids. And it, it's been wonderful just to see how that's helped him. That's just my personal experience. But we do have to capture that in a non-anecdotal way and in a more structured way, and I absolutely accept that. And in capturing some of that uh, improvement and benefit, I would ask the Scottish Government how they're capturing the views of parents. So the views of parents when they depart, when they have no nursery place and they get one, what is the difference they see in relation to the quality and the development of their children, or they have a part-time place and that goes to a full-time place? Are we capturing some, we capture patient opinion in the NHS, let's capture parent opinion within the childcare sector. I think that would be very powerful as well. One final thing uh, I'd like to say, a couple of things we have to iron out. Uh, some nurseries have partnership status, others don't. That can change in the course of the life of your kid being at nursery. If you start off with your kid in a partnership nursery, paying for it yourself, and overnight the council decides that's no longer a partner nursery. So when your kid then does qualify for a childcare place, you don't get partnership funding. We do need more stability for parents. Of course there's room for improvement in this massive, ambitious plan. But with all of these things, you upscale towards the end of that plan. And I've got every confidence, actually, we'll come together as a parliament that the SNP government will deliver this and the parliament will support this. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In November 2014, the SNP pledged to almost double childcare provision from 600 hours a year to 1,140 a year by August 2020. In principle, I support increasing the number of hours on a targeted basis and speak as someone who has relatively recently availed myself of the current provision. I can accept that the effective provision of childcare to new parents potentially, subject to the matters raised by many in this chamber, can assist children's educational attainment and could close the attainment gap. But it also impacts economically. The challenges around Scottish productivity and growth have been well rehearsed in debates in this chamber and regardless of one's view of the causes, I cannot imagine anyone doubts that removing unnecessary barriers to entering the workplace is a key prerequisite of economic activity. And I also think this is a gendered issue. Uh, the Scottish Government's own figures from the Growing Up in Scotland publication show that currently as many as 70% of all adult women in Scotland are in employment. But for mothers with a child of 10 months old, that falls to 62%. And 21% of mothers of five-year-olds had not been in paid work since they had their child. And I also think there's a socio-economic angle, which Rachel Hamilton touched on. 66% uh, of mothers from the most deprived areas with three-year-olds who seek work are unable to find it. But in the least deprived areas, that is 3%. So having a child appears to affect one's ability to work, particularly for women and particularly for those in more deprived areas. So a childcare extension made available to those who need it most should not only assist in closing the attainment gap from an early age, but could also ensure mothers who want to get back into the workforce are able to, but only if it's accessible. And this is where I think there's a fundamental underlying problem, because if the increased or even the current places are neither accessible nor compatible with work commitments, they arguably become valueless in terms of economic activity. So let's assume a parent has a nine to five job. To be of value, the childcare must fit around those hours in order to allow the primary caregiver to return to work. Yet, Fair Funding for Our Kids stated just last week that 90% of council nurseries do not provide full working day ELC places. And just 10% of council nurseries are open between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. or longer. The hours, according to campaigners, during which parents need the childcare. Although 23 councils claim to offer some children full day places, in fact only 3% of all council nursery children have places starting at 8 a.m. or earlier, and just 2% have places ending at 5.15 or later. And I haven't even touched on that most local authority nurseries offer places that are only available during school term times. I know Ian Gray made that point at the outset. 
What is particularly interesting in the context of economic activity and poverty is that the more deprived areas then seem to have less choice in terms of providers and the longer hours. And this has a practical impact. According to Fair Funding for Our Kids, 90% of parents say a lack of appropriate childcare is the main barrier holding back their career. Daniel Johnson reported uh, that 40% of parents feel dissatisfied with their childcare arrangements. But that report goes on to say that half of that 40% said the hours available were too short or didn't suit their working requirements. And of course, those parents who do need to go back to work, who have not got access, will have to pay for the childcare themselves. Scottish Government research has established that two thirds of families with preschool children have experienced difficulties in finding the money to pay nursery fees. According to one report from last October, childcare is costing parents 41% of their average salary. So again, it's all very well having the extra hours, but if parents can't access them or take advantage, the perfectly laudable aims are defeated. Very briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Gillian Martin. Would the member agree that it's also important that people want to train as childminders, get flexible education? And being a member from the North East, you'll know that North East Scotland College have got flexible course arrangements where people want to transition into that sector. Liam Kerr. Uh, yes, I would agree. I'm going to come on to the child minders, if you don't mind, but also I do note uh, in the Audit Scotland, uh, or the Accounts Commission report, of course, there's a point about linking the education and training uh, to parents coming back to work. So I, th I think the point's well made. On the solution, uh, we've long said that parents should be able to access their free hours of childcare wherever and whenever they want. The most straightforward way to do this is to give parents the freedom to redeem their entitlement whenever they need it at approved childcare providers. This ensures that, ch that funding follows the child. It's what families have been calling for, childcare providers have been calling for, and what we've been calling for. So I hope the SNP will act on that. On which note, we would also look to increase accessibility to a broader range of accredited childcare providers, such as childminders. Uh, now, I, I heard John Swinney's intervention that childminders were not excluded, but just a few months ago, the Scottish Childminding Association said their members were being excluded from the SNP's expansion plans. And they suggest of the 6,000 childminders in Scotland, only 100 are commi currently commissioned by local authorities to deliver childcare. At a time where there are fewer childcare providers, fewer qualified teachers, particularly in the Northeast, and limited flexibility, it is absurd to be ignoring childminders who can provide high quality, flexible childcare. Deputy Presiding Officer, the, There's no SN time. the no SNP time. have made a flagship commitment to improve the hours of childcare, but there is no point in extending hours if they cannot be used effectively. Parents need to be given a real choice about the provider they use, and the flexibility of the hours should be tailored to their needs. That's the sort of innovation which will deliver the real benefit of the hours promised, deliver women back into the economy, and deliver access to early learning and childcare that will help give our child, uh, children the start that they deserve. Thank you. And the last of the open debate speakers is Claire Hockey. Excuse me, Ms. Hockey, if you, you're not turned on, if you excuse the expression. <laughs> Uh, can we have a look at Ms. Hockey's microphone, please? Can you take your card out and put it back in again? Hey, that's good. <laughs> Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. From listening to today's speeches, it's clear that we all agree, no matter the party, that supporting our children in their earliest years enables them to have the best opportunities in learning and development. The upbringing of our children will help shape the people they turn out to be in later life. So the time and effort that we give them in this early stage is immeasurable. Presiding officer, as has been clearly outlined during this debate, the SNP are committed to ensuring that all of Scotland's children get the best start in life, no matter their background. This flagship policy for supporting children during their early years is a massive expansion in good quality, flexible childcare a policy which will help lift families out of poverty and reduce inequality. But, presiding officer, it would be remiss of me not to concede that the expansion will be difficult. However, it is a challenge that the Scottish Government have pledged to meet. It's not unusual at this point in the life of any major project for people to have different ideas as to the final outcomes and costs. But what is not in doubt is that the Scottish Government has pledged to fully fund this policy. The plan to nearly double early learning and childcare entitlement is Scotland's single most transformative infrastructure project and will make a vital contribution to our priorities to grow our economy, tackle inequality and close the attainment gap. 
It may not be as structurally challenging as the Queensferry crossing, however, it will be equally as demanding. And as we have heard, it will require substantial levels of investment in, in infrastructure over the next three years, alongside the recruitment of up to 20,000 additional qualified workers. Today's motion quite rightly argues that the Scottish Government should engage closely with local authorities to deliver on this target. As the Audit Scotland report states, the Scottish Government and councils have worked well to expand provision. And it is local authorities themselves who deliver early learning and childcare, whether through their own provision or through partnerships with the private and third sector. So it's vital that the Government and COSLA can continue to work constructively together. Presiding officer, I wish to mention that this Saturday I am officially opening a partner provided nursery in my constituency of Rutherglen. Ace Place is an innovative nursery who are committed to supporting our young children. The children in their care spend the majority of their time outdoors and their particular nursery I'm opening in Burnside has actually been expanded to take into account the increased childcare provision support by the Scottish Government. Alison Harkin, the director of Ace Place, told me every year of a, life, a child's life is precious. However, when it comes to their development and the first few years, they are the most important. Our overriding priority is the health and happiness of our children. And if we can achieve this, then we will ensure our children get the best possible start in life. That's why I welcome the ongoing commitment by the Scottish Government and the recognition of the role that private and third sector nurseries have in meeting their ambitions for ex expansion. And she added, the plans are incredibly ambitious and if realised, it will be a revolution in early years education and childcare in Scotland. But, presiding officer, as an MSP representing a South Lanarkshire constituency, it would be remiss of me not to mention today's events in the council headquarters during the setting of the local authority's budget. Um, I think it's rich that the Tories are trying to play, portray themselves as a party of families and the party of early childcare. I have here the Tory amendment for the South Lanarkshire Council budget, which was passed in Hamilton today, thankfully without the Tory amendments. Within this, there is cut after cut. The SNP's administration's proposals for holiday lunch cuts in areas of high deprivation cut from the budget. The SNP administration's proposals for uplifting school clothing grants and automatic enrolment cut from the budget. Yeah. And the extension of concessions yeah. for under 16s clubs cut from the budget. Yeah. From the Tory amendments, it appears they wish to remove these new initiatives, all initiatives which will help the most vulnerable in our society within my constituency and their families so they can save households a few pounds per year in council tax. The SNP administration in South Lanarkshire shares the concerns of the SNP in Holyrood that our overriding priority should always be that of our children and certainly not at the expense of the richest in our society. Presiding officer, in summing up, working towards educational excellence for all and closing the gap in attainment between our young people from the most and least deprived communities is a defining mission of the SNP and one which I am extremely proud of. Yeah, yeah. We now move to the closing speeches and time is tight, so no more than six minutes, please. Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In closing for Scottish Labour today, can I thank the Conservative Party for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber. The Audit Scotland Early Learning and Childcare Report is a crucial analysis of where we are as a country in delivering for the needs of children and for the needs of parents. And the report, whilst Highlighting some good aspects, it doesn't make good reading for anyone hopeful that the policy of almost doubling free early learning and childcare will be ready for 2020. Four years on from the announcement and only two away from the proposed implementation, Audit Scotland warns that there are significant risks that councils will not be able to expand ELC to 1140 hours by 2020. And these warnings are addressed in the motion by Michelle Ballantyne, MSP, and they have our support. We want to ensure that children in early years education and childcare receive the very best start in life. The increase in free nursery education is a necessary tool in reducing inequality and narrowing the attainment gap that follows far too many children as they move into primary and secondary education and on into adult life. High quality, affordable early learning and childcare is essential for children from poorer backgrounds. 
However, the reality is that nursery fees in the UK are some of the highest in Europe. And within the UK, Scotland is higher than many regions in England. And the savings in monthly childcare will be a very welcome relief for many, as well creating the opportunity for parents, especially mothers, to return to the workplace. And when women have the opportunity to return to the workplace, it shouldn't have to be in a reduced capacity in terms of hours, in terms of role, or in terms of status. And the reality is that three quarters of women continue to play the role of primary caregiver, meaning that they are too often restricted to the type of employment that they can access. And a contributing factor to this is the availability and the flexibility of early learning and childcare. And the recent findings by Fair Funding for Our Kids show that only one in 10 council nurseries are open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And other speakers this afternoon have highlighted this issue as well. And this situation may be suitable for a minority of parents, such as those working nine to five, with a short commuting distance, or parents not in work. For the majority, nursery hours must be more flexible. Many parents who work in shift patterns or in zero-hour contracts will find themselves with additional problems in balancing their childcare commitments. Many parents are lucky to have a support system of friends and of family who can help. However, we should be doing more to make childcare much more flexible and to create that wraparound system that meets parents' needs and, most importantly, their expectations. And the Audit Scotland report warns us that the current uptake of 600 hours free childcare is lower for vulnerable two-year-olds than it should be. There are issues of making parents aware of their entitlement, and again, that's been highlighted in today's debate. And the report offers some very strong recommendations in promoting childcare hours. However, for those vulnerable children missing out now, it could be too little, too late in actually improving their life chances. And Deputy Presiding Officer, we will support the SNP amendment tonight. However, in giving our support to the SNP amendment, it's important to point out that by highlighting some positives in their amendment, they are ignoring the many negative aspects in both the Audit Scotland report and by the concerns that have been raised by parents. And they do need to come back to this chamber and address those concerns. Action is needed now to ensure that we have a system that works and a system that provides the service that parents want and the service that children need. We need to have more than a, a positive spin that gets us through an afternoon debate by talking about the good and completely ignoring the negative. And finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, the lack of oversight by the government in planning for the rollout of the 1140 hours is a concern. And as I said earlier, it was 2014 when this policy was announced. And with two years to go, the Audit Scotland report shows the mismatch of financial, financial estimations between the Scottish government and local government. And as councils prepare cuts to budgets in the coming weeks, the Scottish Government should be working to ensure that every single council is fully funded to meet their childcare policy. That's what Scottish Labour would do. We would create a more flexible, all age, all year, wrap round, affordable childcare, childcare system that benefits every single child. Thank you. I call John Swinney. Uh, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Swinney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, if I've succeeded in anything this afternoon without even uttering a word, it's to uh, rebalance the, um, the, the contents of what might have been um, approved by Parliament tonight by putting in place some positive reflections on the contents of the Audit of Scotland report. Uh, it may be um, questions why we haven't got any negative parts. Well, we thought, we thought there were enough in the Conservative motion to begin with. So we're simply rebalancing the debate. This has actually been a very constructive debate, and um, I thank the Conservatives for bringing it forward. because It gives us an opportunity to reflect on an important report about the 
uh, rollout of early learning and childcare. And I want to be clear at the outset of my contribution in closing the debate that I, I agree with Ian Gray that the purpose of the rollout of early learning and childcare must be to contribute to the achievement of the best outcomes for children, but also to create the greater opportunities for their parents to enter the labour market and to provide those opportunities to do so. And of course, I will do that in a moment. And of course, some of those opportunities will come in the expansion of the workforce, which is arising out of the changes that we're making. I'll give way to Mr. Gray. Ian Gray. I appreciate Mr. Swinney's point. I did want to ask him the question that, that he asked me, and I'm glad that his answer, I think, was the same as mine. But does he accept that Audit Scotland makes, makes the point that sometimes the, the primacy, if that's the right word, of outcomes for the children are, are not clear? And so uh, it, what they say is um, it's not always clear which of those priorities should be given greater weight? So is he suggesting that it will be the case in future? That John Swinney. This is where Mr Gray will not be surprised to hear that I part company with Audit Scotland on some of their analysis, because I think it's pretty obvious, given the government's wider policy framework and the intense focus we have on getting it right for every child, that that is the policy driver of this agenda, to make sure that young people, and, my, and a number of colleagues have made this point, Gillian Martin made the point, Claire Hockey made the point, that the early years of young people's lives are utterly critical in the formulation, formulation of their cognitive ability. So I think that is crystal clear. That's why I, I, I question why Audit Scotland challenges the government about the uh, the, the business case and the rationale we should apply to this policy because to, to, to focus on what Mr Doris said, Bob Doris quoted Sir Harry Burns who essentially says, you know, we've, we've looked at all the evidence and I've heard this from Sir Harry Burns on numerous occasions in my ministerial life, we've looked at all the evidence, we know what we've got to do, could we just get on and do it? And that's how I feel about this policy, we're trying to get on and do it and I just question why Audit Scotland labours so extensively the need for us to have looked at um, alternative business cases when we know that the evidence tells us early intervention to uh, support the cognitive development of young people through quality early learning and childcare is invaluable. And that's, if I could, if I could develop the point just a little bit further, I will give way. This brings me to the point on, on outcomes that Jenny Mara raised, because in the survey which was undertaken about um, the impact of the 600 hours, and I'm not trying to suggest the 600 hours are panacea because the 600 hours are, we're, we're building on the 600 hours, so we can't believe it's a panacea. At paragraph 60 of the Audit Scotland report on page 23, they talk about the improvements in outcomes in speech and language, in uh, improvements in cognitive development, improvement in social skills, improvement in behaviour, and improvements in children's ability to uh, be ready for school when it starts. So these are some of the outcomes that have been achieved as a consequence of the existing policy preserve. I'll give way to Michelle Ballantyne. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think when, when you talk about that evidence of... of what has happened and what we should be doing rolling out forward and whether other other approaches are necessary is that not around things like the vulnerable twos the vulnerable ones who would benefit incredibly from some early years input and, and child care that was really targeted whereas the threes and fours don't show that uplift um, in 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 the advantages of care that the ones and twos would john swinney well there's, well there's a blend there's a there's a blend there because We've got a comprehensive provision that we're planning for three and four year olds and very targeted interventions for eligible two year olds to, to meet their needs. But there are a whole host of other interventions that government makes through the work of our, uh, the, the agenda of getting it right for every child to make sure that we tackle those issues of vulnerability that young people face. Now I want to talk a little bit about the delivery in the time remaining. Um, the Audit Scotland report recognises that we are working well with local authorities to formulate these plans. And I welcome that. And I welcome the contribution of local authorities. But we have to go through a process of understanding fully and properly the financial estimates of local authorities. If we didn't do that, Audit Scotland would be on our back for not doing it. That would be their next report. So Audit Scotland don't suggest that the government's got its numbers wrong. It suggests there's a gap. And we're addressing that gap. And I'd be failing in my duty to the Finance Minister and to Parliament if we didn't properly scrutinise those plans to make sure that the local authority plans are value for money. Now, the other point, 
if Mr. Kerr would forgive me, I, I, I have a couple of other points I need to make to close. Mr. My intervention to Mr. Mundell earlier on was designed to be helpful because I want to see childminders and partner providers part of the solution. I do not want to see them carved out of this. I say that clearly to Parliament. But I need local authorities to embrace childminders and partner providers. So colleagues in all parties have colleagues that lead local authorities around the country. I have many local authorities led by my party, the Conservatives, the Labour Party have the same. Uh, and um, it's important that we use our political influence to encourage our local authority colleagues to... There's no time, ensure, Mr Mundell. Well, I, 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 well, I'm happy to exchange with Mr Mundell later on, but I want to give the clearest signal to Parliament that the government wants to broaden that participation, but we need our local authority partners to be with us in so doing, and any support in that respect will be welcome. The last point I want to make is about workforce. We estimate that we will need around about 11,000 people to be, 11,000 headcount to be delivering this policy. We have uh, commissioned uh, early starts into that uh, and we anticipate about 3,000 in this year and that will rise in the course of the next two years to ensure that we are ready to implement this. It is a big challenge, but we are taking forward the very active communication campaigns to ensure that we can motivate individuals to participate in, the, in learning childcare and participate in improving the in creating the best possible outcomes for the children of our country. I call Michelle Ballantyne to wind up this debate. Can you take us to decision time, please, Ms. Ballantyne? Presiding officer, um, can I just start by apologising on behalf of Liz Smith, who should be closing for us today. Um, she's been called away to deal with a family issue related to the weather and the presiding officer very kindly allowed it. This debate has shown clearly the considerable importance that all parties in this chamber attach to the expansion of childcare, but it has also shown clearly the extent of the challenges, most especially those faced as we try to strike the right balance in terms of extending the number of hours available and the qualitative issues in terms of ensuring there is much better accessibility and flexibility, both of which are so important to parents and which will be the defining issues about whether or not Scotland succeeds in delivering a world-class childcare system. There is no point extending hours if they can't be used effectively, and that, those things have been picked up by Jenny Gilthruth and Jenny Mara during this debate. There is a demand and supply issue to this whole debate, and we need to accept that there are some tensions, more of which I'll speak about in a minute, like any effective policy, there ought to be a solid base of evidence which underpins it. And it is on this issue that I want to concentrate the early remarks, as we cannot hope to know what will make the most effective delivery of childcare if we have not undertaken the necessary cost-benefit analysis of what works and what doesn't work. The Audit Scotland Accounts Commission was scathing in its comments, but whilst the ambition was in line with the national strategic objectives, the Scottish Government did not undertake any effective analysis once the 600 hours were in place. And we are now five years on from that point. The Scottish Government had implemented the increase in hours without comparing the cost and potential outcomes of expanding childcare or looking at the different economic models of childcare and how they compare in terms of delivery. In other words, it did not identify what measures would indicate success or what baseline data was available, and it has not evaluated the... John Swinney. I, I, I'm grateful, I'd be grateful if Michelle Banton would set out what other model the government should have examined, because if she believes we should have examined some other model, she does not agree with us that we should be expanding to 1140 hours. Michelle Ballantyne. I don't think it's as simple as that, Cabinet Secretary. When, when we talk about other models, I mean, there are, there are models all over the world in terms of delivering effective childcare. Um, we personally choose to look at those who are most vulnerable first and, and focus on them. But, I mean, my point is that you chose not to. You, you are applying on with it regardless. The impact of £650 million of additional fund... Uh, sorry, I've lost my place. The baseline was available. And was, has not evaluated the impact of the £650 million of additional funding. 
So crucially, there is no evidence to show how increasing the amount three or four year olds spend in nursery is advantageous to them. And I make this point about evidence because we have seen outside bodies criticise the Scottish Government in other areas of policy for a lack of good quality data. The assessment of the curriculum of excellence being an important example. Likewise, the report highlighted the fact that the Scottish Government still has much work to do with the Department for Work and Pensions and HM Customs and Revenue to establish exactly where the eligible two-year-olds are so that they can be the focus of more accurate targeting. Presiding officer, perhaps one of the most telling parts of the report is the criticism that the Scottish Government has not defined what it means by high-quality childcare, and I want to dwell on this. Ask any parent, and it is this matter which rightly has the highest priority. Firstly, parents will talk about the right numbers of fully qualified staff. We know in Scotland that early learning staff have fallen by 44.8% since 2008. So not only is this the main reason behind local authorities projecting an additional £160 million cost than the Gov Scottish Government has estimated, since this is largely the staffing shortfall that would have to be addressed, but there is also the issue about different staffing ratios which are requir required for different age groups. And some of that analysis does not appear to have been factored in appropriately. Likewise, in an age where many, when many professionals feel less secure in their jobs, there is the additional training that is required to ensure that staff are fully qualified to meet the modern challenges of early learning. Because listening to staff, there are, they are more substantial than most of us realise. But whilst the quality of staff is probably the main concern from parents, so too is the quality of the learning environment. And here lies the issue about providers. There are now 848 fewer early learning and childcare services than there were in 2008, a decline which has predominantly occurred in the more deprived areas. This, this has coincided with a decline in the number of childcare services rated good or better, which now stands at its lowest point in half a decade. And these are just the ones we know about. Last year, it was reported that since 2011, nursery inspections had fallen by a third. So there is a strong message here for the Scottish Government about quality of delivery. The questions I have about provision relate to the emphasis being in the right place. Our local authorities are not showing strong levels of interest in the area of one and two year olds. And that is an area where the Conservatives believe there should be the most important focus, especially when it comes to our most vulnerable children. And we base that supposition on the extensive research about where early learning can make the most substantial difference. And related to this is the fear amongst many private sector providers that local authorities are much more likely to want to, con want to concentrate on the three and four year old provision from which it e is easier to deliver economies of scale and cost savings in comparison with the more staff intensive one and two year old provision. Such an imbalance would be unfortunate and I urge the Scottish Government to think carefully about the potential repercussions. And can I once again ask the Scottish Government to reconsider the illog illogicality of its plans to allow private profit-making nurseries to enjoy the full 100% business rate relief, but not those of not-for-profit nurseries, which are within charitable foundations, which, after all, are in a position to provide additional places to assist local authorities with meeting increased demand. This does not make any sense at all at a time when there is such pressure being applied to parents for a better service. These nurseries are often some who can offer more flexible hours as well. And I think also we should remember that many parents are looking to ensure that their nursery feeds into their choice of primary. And it is, not, and it is to the issue of flexibility that I come next. The Scottish Conservatives believe this issue is of primary importance. And therefore, it is crucial to listen to the providers and to the parents about what exactly they want when it comes to make the important distinction between choice and flexibility. These two issues are related, but they are also different, and this matters. We want parents to have real choice about the kind of provider they wish to use, but we also want them to enjoy the additional advantage of flexible hours, a point that has continually been made by Fair Funding for Our Kids whose published research shows that only one in ten local nurseries 
provides the length of care to cover the full working day. In 19 out of Scotland's 32 local authorities, there are no public nurseries doing the full stretch of 8 till 6 p.m. And this must surely tell us something about the lack of incentives within the system. Because if we are to live up to parents' aspirations for top quality childcare, then flexible access is key. Now, I thought the Scottish Government was moving in the right direction on this, but things seem to have got stuck. On the 23rd of March 2017, when Liz Smith asked Mark MacDonald, the then Children's Minister, when he was what, what he was proposing when he mentioned the possibility of a childcare account, he said, and I quote, my officials will work in partnership with local authorities to develop the detail of the funding model and the national standard, and I can announce that we will commission a feasibility study to explore the potential costs and benefits of introducing an early learning and childcare account in the future. I welcome, Liz Smith welcomed that at the time, as the Scottish Conservatives are quite sure that the account stroke voucher system is the best way of delivering both more choice and greater flexibility. For those local authorities which have moved closest to this system, e.g. here in Edinburgh, where there seem to be more satisfied parents and a better quality of provision. So can I ask this children's minister what progress has been made on this feasibility study and when will we see a childcare account? And when, as was flagged up by the Accounts Commission, you winding me up, aren't you? All right, okay. Um, very quickly then. Uh, summing up then, it's abundantly clear that these reports have laid bare the extent of the challenges we face. I hope you have listened to some of the comments today and I hope that your sense when you go away is not one of people being here to attack but of a, a chamber that wants to see this succeed but we need you to listen to everybody to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much and that concludes our debate on early years and childcare. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions, motion 10721, setting out a business programme, and motion 10722 on a stage one timetable. If any objects, please say so now. And could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick? Uh, Joe Formally Fitzpatrick, moved. To move. Thank you very much, Mr Fitzpatrick. No member has objected. Uh, the question, therefore, is that motions 10721 and motions 10, motion 10722 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of five parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motion 10724 on designation of a lead committee, motion 10725 on referral of the local government finance order, motion 10726 on approval of an SSI, Motion 10746 on designation of a lead committee and motion 10751 on meetings of committees. Moved on block. Thank you very much. So we come to decision time. The first question is that amendment 10650.3 in the name of Marie Todd, which seeks to amend motion 10650 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne on early years and childcare be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 10650 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne as agreed, eh, so as amended, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I propose to put a single question on the five parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No. Uh, the question is that motions 10724, 10725, 10726, 10746 and 10751 all be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Claire Hockey on eating disorders and we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.